Jake with the Human Services Student Organization, and uh, we have the honor of having an amazing guest speaker come talk to you all today, uh, Ms. Anita ayers Henderlight. She's the Executive Director from uh, Africa ELI. It's a nonprofit that supports uh, funding and education for uh, women in South Sudan, uh, specializes in child advocacy and uh, gender equity. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to hand it over to her and uh, give her a round of applause if you could. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, fabulous people. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Ana Murtaha. That means I'm happy in Arabic. And I have, let's see, a very good friend who attends ETSU, who happens to be a lost boy of Sudan. Does anybody in here know Mr. Victor Chol? Ooh, yay, one, two, three. You know him. Guess what? If you participate when I ask questions, I brought bling. <laughs> Word, yeah, okay, <laughs> let's see. How about, thank you, you know him, I am so glad. Tell him that Anita said hello. I invited him today, but he was otherwise occupied. <clears throat> but let's start from the very beginning, okay? Why, how would I be standing in front of you talking about a place called South Sudan, Africa and the kids who live there. How does that happen, right? 2005. How old were you in 2005? Okay, 14, 15 and older then. <laughs> 14, 15. Okay, 2005, July 4. I was in one of my most favorite places, Barnes and Noble bookstore in Knoxville, Tennessee. There was a book, a new book on the shelf in the biography section. It captured my attention. It's yellow, it's colorful, it's got three little boys on the front. So I pick it up and I, I looked at the title, they poured fire on us from the sky. What does that mean? I, I don't know what that means. What does that mean? They poured fire on us from the sky. So I pick it up, and I'm going to share with you what I read that afternoon from the jacket cover, okay? Five-year-old Benjamin. All right, so think in your mind about a kindergartner, okay? Five-year-old Benjamin stood in the field tending goats when raiders arrived. Moments later, as gunshots, flames, and screams engulfed his village, Benjamin found himself running as fast as his little legs could carry him into the cover of the forest. In a nearby village, his cousins, seven-year-olds, Alefo and Benson, were driven from their homes as well. Every step led the boys away from their peaceful, rural world, a traditional world where spear-toting fathers protected their huts from lions that roamed by night. With each footstep, they were drawn deeper into the horrific violence of Sudan's civil war. A world of bombed-out villages, landmine-sown roads, and relentless desert, a world where starving adults would snatch the grain from a weak child's fingers. Across Sudan, between 1987 and 1989, tens of thousands of young boys took flight from these massacres. They became known as the Lost boys, with little more than the clothes on their backs and sometimes not even that, they streamed out over Sudan in search of refuge. Their journey led them first to Ethiopia and then driven back into Sudan toward Kenya. They walked, okay, walked nearly 1,000 miles, sustained only by the sheer will to live. 
I find that very compelling. Yes? I didn't know. I was in college between 1987 and 1989, and you'd think that maybe if there were thousands of children being massacred somewhere on the planet, that we would hear about it, right? You would hope. Maybe I just wasn't socially conscious enough back then, but I didn't know. And so I started to read this book right there at the Barnes & Noble store. And then I kept turning the pages and I sat down on the floor. I was one of those people. You have to walk <laughs> around at Barnes & Noble. And three hours later on the floor, I turned the last page of the book and I bought it. And my whole world has changed. That is the power of reading. That's the power of a book. It was written by three lost boys who survived the experience in Sudan. And they were joined by Judy Bernstein, an author who wrote the story with them. <clears throat> After I read it, I decided I wanted to meet lost boys of Sudan. In 2001, Okay, uh, 10 years ago, the United States of America allowed about 3,600 of these young men into the United States. And I thought, well, surely I can find one. <laughs> the three of these guys, they live in San Diego, California. Well, that was a little far for an afternoon drive from Knoxville, Tennessee. So <clears throat> I called a resettlement organization to find out if there were any lost boys of Sudan who had come to East Tennessee. I was thinking I'd probably have to go to Washington DC maybe or Atlanta or Nashville in order to find three lost boys. Hey no, there were three 20 minutes from my house. One of those was Victor Chol, who's a grad student here now at ETSU. The other two were his cousins, Jimmy and Angelo. I met them. They told me about things that I had read in this book, but they'd never read the book. They didn't need to because they lived it. It belonged to them. What's in here, what's written, it was their story from being ages five, six, and seven and having to escape massacres in their village and go to Ethiopia. Well, we became very good friends, <clears throat> and I just kept ferociously reading more about South Sudan and Africa. I will freely confess that before 2005, I couldn't even find South Sudan on a map. And now, fast forward to 2011, I live six months of my life in America, and six months of my life actually in South Sudan. How did it happen? Victor, Jimmy, and Angelo, they said, Anita, go. Go to Sudan, go see. You obviously have this really strong interest now. Go see what it's like in our homeland. So I packed my bags, got a few little shots, and in April of 2006, I went to Sudan, Africa. 2006, 2007, I visited. 2008, I began working full time on issues related to education, children, and youth in this country. And that's what I'm going to share with you here today in this PowerPoint. It's the story of Africa ELI Education and Leadership Initiative. Talk about what it's like to work in the education sector in South Sudan and show you some of our students. So does that sound like something you signed up for today and is reasonable? Yes. You ready, you wanna do it? Okay, all right. Hey, show of hands, anybody here ever been to South Sudan, Africa? Just not yet. Anybody been to Africa? I know you have. Oh, look, you've been there, you get some little bling too. <clears throat> Woohoo! all right, yay. <laughs> She's been to the neighbor. She's been to Kenya, right? Yes. 
Okay. All right. Africa Education and Leadership Initiative with a leadership initiative with the help of Miss Debbie. Let's go to the next picture. From bullets to ballots to freedom. Okay, let's talk about how these massacres occurred. The country, Sudan, was at war. All right? Sudan, at that time, imagine in your brain everything from, uh, from the state of Maine to Florida, from the Mississippi River to the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, that was the size of Sudan, Africa. Let me break it down for you. The north, mostly brown, Islamic, Muslim. The south, very black, traditional, African, Christian. In the north, not many resources. Very dry, very desert. In the south, very lush, very green, very fertile. Some of the best okra, tomatoes, potatoes, and carrots can be grown in South Sudan better than you've ever tasted. It's like um, Florida on steroids. <laughs> okay? It's, anything can grow there. Uh, the North also had had more access to education. The South, not so much. Uh, the North, very close ties to the Middle East. And the South, very close ties to their East African neighbors, Kenya, Uganda, Congo. Um, so they were fighting, the North and the South. A civil war over the same reasons that all wars are fought. What are those reasons? Greed, power, economics, religion, absolutely. So in 2005, there was a peace agreement signed between the North and the South, giving the South an opportunity to become independent from the North, to become its own country. So we went from bullets to ballots. In 2010, there was the very first presidential, democratic presidential election held in South Sudan, and then in January of this year, 2011, we had a referendum vote. 98.9% of the population in the south of Sudan voted for independence. They voted to become free from the oppression of the north. So that moves us from ballots to bullets to freedom. And this woman in the middle, she, uh, for the very first time, voted in an election. She's 28, 29, and she is holding her little voter registration card that she is so proud of. And she stood for hours in the hot sun at a little elementary school where they were registering people to vote. She stood in that line until she had this card to show, saying that she was eligible to vote. The birth of the world's newest country. That's what we got. On July 9, 2011, South Sudan was officially born. I left here on July 4, the day of our independence in America, so that I could be in Juba, the capital of South Sudan, on the day of independence, its very first independence. I wanted to see what it was like to give birth to a country. And some of the following pictures will show you that. Go ahead. Okay, but first, let's make sure we know where we're talking about, okay? So here, this lovely globe, the green patch, South Sudan. Now, since they've been split, think about Texas times two. That's the size, okay? And it has a population somewhat equivalent to New York, okay? So that's what we're talking about now when we say South Sudan. Now here, you can more clearly see the area. It's 10 states that make up the country. And way down here, Y-E-I is a nice little place and that's where I live when I'm in South Sudan. And you pronounce it, yay! 
<laughs> and wait, it gets better. Here's a place, it's spelled W-A-U. We have students there, and that location is pronounced WOW. <laughs> so I live in Yay and work in WOW. <laughs> I'm such a lucky girl. Okay, so this is South Sudan, Africa. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Ah, faces of freedom. Here's what it looks like on the day that a country is born. Go ahead. Just like at football games or big sporting events, people have painted their faces and are showing the colors of the new country. Go ahead. And this is what it looks like. The flag in South Sudan varies from the north with the addition of the blue triangle and the yellow star. So when you see a flag that is green, white, red, and black, that's North Sudan. When you see the flag with the addition of the blue triangle and star, that's the south of Sudan. 193rd country recognized by the United Nations. The 54th country in Africa. Those are just your little random fun facts, okay? Now, but Sorry. wait, go back. I want to tell you what it was like to see the flag go up for the very first time, okay? So it's like New Year's Eve on July 8th. Nobody has slept. Everybody's awake. Everybody's dancing and singing, and the air really is electric because of what's about to happen on July 9th. We've been out all day, all the people from the United Nations and international community, they've come to South Sudan. There have been lots of speeches, and finally, about 1.30 in the afternoon, they're going to raise the flag for the very first time. Oh, and they do it very dramatically, right? With, oh, it's so slow. People are just waiting for it to get to the top. Oh my gosh, it gets to the top and it just hangs there. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. <laughs> and you know that there's this collective gasp by the crowd, right? I mean, there are millions of people gathered in Juba and we're just, <gasps> you know, we are willing a gust of wind to come along and fly that flag. <laughs> so we stand. A tiny little gust comes. <laughs> okay, really? That's all? <laughs> we need wind. And it seemed like 20 hours. It was probably just 20 seconds. But finally, finally, this gust of wind comes along and the flag opens for the very first time and starts to fly. And a country has been born. It was probably the most incredible moment I have ever experienced. I've had a lot of experiences in life, but that was just such a powerful, historic moment where people felt free. Freedom is not overrated. Don't ever take your freedom from gr for granted here in America. Go ahead. God bless South Sudan. What do you do when a baby's born, right? You got to name it. If you're a country, you need a new song, a national anthem. You need this new flag. And so God Bless South Sudan is a line in the new national anthem. And just for fun, not right now, but later you can Google the new national anthem of South Sudan. And you can hear school kids singing it at the top of their voices, tops of their lungs. I'm loving her. Ooh, she took fabric in the same colors of the flag and made it into a dress. She's very fashionable. Go ahead. Waving it. Everybody was waving flags. Go ahead. Welcome to Africa's youngest nation. This is what the billboard reads when you arrive at the Juba Airport, the capital in South Sudan. Welcome to the newest nation. Go ahead. God bless South Sudan.
this is after the fact. And you know, after there's a party, you got to clean up. So we had to do that too. Go ahead. Ah, so much dancing. Go ahead. And I love this woman standing to the right of me. Okay. She's found a feather duster in the colors of the new flag. <laughs> <laughs> She's got spirit. <laughs> um, if you are friends with anybody at the University of Tennessee in the anthropology department, uh, Dr. Mia was with me on that day in Juba. She was um, a guest who came to witness the birth of the country as well. Go ahead. Oh, we're hanging out of cars. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Oh, hey, so now what? <laughs> We've got a new country. Now what? Go ahead. If you're Africa ELI, we continue to educate. Go ahead. Africa ELI's mission is to bridge gender gaps through education. We do this because in South Sudan, less than 7% Okay, single digits. Less than 7% of the girls make it above the seventh grade. Hey, that's so not right. Girls deserve access to education just like their male counterparts. We had read all of these statistics before, but when we were on the ground in South Sudan 2005-2006, we saw it firsthand. We would go and we would visit schools and all the boys would be there and they'd be like you, taking notes this morning, you know, paying attention. And where are the girls? There are no girls. Our organization started out in 2006 originally simply to provide access to education for high school students, secondary students. But when we discovered that there were no girls, we began to focus primarily on girls. So we recruit and retain high school girls. 75% of our sponsorships go to high school students who are girls. 25% goes to boys. We decided we still needed to include the boys because, hey, if we're bridging gender gaps, then we need to be gender friendly too, right? So 75%, 25%. And these are some of our students that you see right here, bright and beautiful. And these are all girls. Go ahead. All right, so we educate. We decided also, you know, we knew that this opportunity was going to be available, um, that it would become a new country. And if you're going to have leaders who will be able to facilitate that happening and make progress in the future, you wanted people to have more than a seventh grade education, right? Absolutely. So, go ahead. We focus, as I've said, on secondary schools. This is one of our very first classes. We started on May 19, 2008, with 18 girls. Go ahead. And what did we begin teaching? Same things you learn here. English, math, bio, chem, physics, ag, geography, health, commerce, history, CRE, and enrichment. Who in this room would like to guess what CRE stands for? Or maybe you know. Do you know? Raise your hand if you know. CRE. What is that? Um, is that Christianity <coughs> Education? Ding, ding, you get bling. I am so proud of you. <clears throat> CRE stands for Christian Religious Education. And it is mandated, okay? Synonym for that, required. It is required by the government of South Sudan to teach CRE in all high schools across South Sudan. So we do. Go ahead. Shelter. We have discovered that it is best if girls have an opportunity to go to boarding school rather than day school. Why? One, it's not always safe for girls to be walking from their home to a school in the morning very early before the sun comes up 
or very late at night because it's very common for students to walk two to five miles to get to school. A lot of things can happen in the dark, on a dirt road, on your way to school. So it's not really very safe. Uh, secondly, we've also discovered that in this very traditionally patriarchal society, the labor force has been the females. So if girls go to school during the day and they go home, they have to work. They have to fetch water. They have to get the firewood for cooking. They have to take care of their younger siblings. That leaves no time for studying. If they can't study, they don't pass any tests. If they don't pass tests, they fail. If they fail, they drop out. If they drop out, then they become simply another statistic, another baby-making machine in Africa and are sold off with a bride price and have many little children of their own. Now, it's not bad for them to want to be mothers, to want to be uh, wives and have their own families. That's, we embrace that, but not when you are 13, 14, 15, and 16 years old. You need to have the chance to focus on education. That's your job. So if we keep them in boarding schools, they're much more likely to have success than if they go to a day school. Go ahead. We feed three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Breakfast is usually a um, porridge, oatmeal type substance. And then lunch, we usually have um, rice and beans. And then for dinner, we generally have beans and rice. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> we inform. <laughs> please don't pick your nose in public. And please brush your teeth at least twice a day. Now, these girls, our sponsored Africa ELI students, have an opportunity to take the knowledge they're learning in the classroom and become instant teachers because we encourage them to take that knowledge and inform the people in the village and in the community of what they're learning. Education was interrupted in South Sudan for more than 50 years. So there are many people, it's a very high rate of illiteracy. If our girls can take what they're learning and immediately share that, we want them to do so. This is a public health service announcement. The girls obviously learned you know, uh, some hyg hygiene, uh, sanitation, so she made a little sign, don't pick your nose in public, goes out to the dirt road, stands, holds up her sign, and the people that are going by, you know, she tells, don't pick your nose in public. <laughs> And additionally, go ahead, they put on these snazzy little aprons for what we call a mobile health clinic or community health outreach. Not only do they find ways to educate uh, around and near the campus, but they go to local clinics and local hospitals so that when a family is waiting for a loved one to be treated, uh, or they've had to go to the clinic themselves and they're, they've received treatment and they're waiting to get to go home, our girls can talk with them and talk to them about sanitation and hygiene and symptoms and signs and what you need to do uh, for some of the basic health uh, preventions and treatments for that area. Our biggest issues continue to be malaria, typhoid, and cholera are the ones that we battle the most in that area. Not only are the girls learning about health, but they're gaining skills in articulating themselves by becoming these teachers and doing community health outreach. Go ahead. We cultivate. As I told you earlier, we can grow anything. So we like to try and feed ourselves. 
we have school gardens. Uh, this is one of the agriculture teachers that we hire. Now it's nice to be able to feed ourselves and have some sort of addition to the rice and beans occasionally. But why would we really do this for their future? We do school gardens so that they learn better agricultural practices. Yes? So when they graduate and when they have those families, they can have their own gardens at home successfully feeding their family. And if they have a supplement, right? If they have more produce, what can they do? They can sell it. They can take it to market and have income. So you can connect the dots between a school garden, teaching good agricultural practices, being able to feed your family, and earn an income. That's our agricultural program. Go ahead. We empower. OK, this is a bit cutting edge for South Sudan, OK? On Friday afternoons, oh, hey, what's today? Today's Thursday. Tomorrow's Friday. From 3 to 4, we have taken a group of girls and recruited a brave group of young men to go into a radio station. We give them a microphone, and they have a pre-selected topic that they are going to debate for the next hour on air. And about 70,000 people will have an opportunity to hear them, to hear their voices. And in many cases, this is the first time that a girl, a teenage girl, has had an opportunity to express her opinions in front of a teenage boy. And not only in front of a teenage boy, but to an entire village or community. They learn what she's thinking. What are some of her solutions to problems? What are issues that she's concerned about? I've got several favorite topics. One of them is, I, I loved when they went to the radio station and discussed, is girls' education as important as boys' education? And then there was one day they had the topic, um, is early marriage at the age of 13 or 14 a form of gender-based violence? Discuss for an hour on the radio. So what are we teaching here? One, not only research skills and classroom skills because you're, you're preparing for a debate, but more importantly, again, how to communicate, how to raise your voice, to send a message to the girls that you are empowered, your voice matters, and ultimately we do this with the hope that in the future if there is conflict in South Sudan, that they will know how to come to a table and effectively communicate and strategize for solutions rather than pick up guns and kill each other. It's what we hope for. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so in summary, what Africa ELI does, we increase access to education. We improve quality of education and the learning environment. We plan to maintain high retention rates, reduce at-risk behaviors, strengthen leadership skills, improve English comprehension, and bridge gender gaps. These are our goals and essentially what we do do. I told you we started with 18 students in 2008. I am happy to report, okay, if you've been there, 2008, 9, 10, 11. What happens after four years of high school? Uh-huh. We have 54 girls graduating this year. Yay! <laughs> and we sponsor 197, right around 200 meaning we fully sponsor them uh, with education materials, clothes, food, that sort of thing. Uh, but we impact a much larger number because now Africa ELI sponsors students and has programs in four of the ten states of South Sudan. 
We have made it beyond yay. We have made it beyond wow. <laughs> and so there are thousands of students who benefit from the programs we have to offer. Go ahead. If we do our job, we create leaders. We create the leadership of this brand new nation. They are the first generation of educated young people in this new country. Imagine. Go ahead. We believe women are the key to peace. Now you can Google a bunch of statistics, but the message is generally the same. If you educate a girl, you educate a nation. Why? There are all sorts of studies who in, which indicate that women will keep the families healthier if they're educated. They will recognize diseases and symptoms and get help earlier and hopefully save lives. They will also have more input into how the household is run and actually be able to contribute then to the income of the family. And she will simply raise her family differently than how she was raised or how traditionally girls have been raised in South Sudan. What will happen? She'll know how to read to her kids at night. She'll be able maybe to help them with their homework. She'll be able to provide for her family in ways that her mother likely was not able to provide for her. And the country progresses with women's education. Go ahead. Oh, we do all of this. How much time do I have? Where are we? OK, good. Because I do not want you to miss a minute of Kenneth's story. All the work that we do, there are six of us employed by Africa ELI. Four Southern Sudanese, two Americans. I'm one of the Americans. And we're very gender friendly here. The other one is a man. <laughs> so a man and a woman, we come to America, we educate, we advocate, and we raise money to keep our girls in school there. Uh, but we cannot pretend to be Americans going into another country pretending to know what's best for that country, right? That just makes us stupid Americans, and that's ugly. So you have to work with the people on the ground, the locals. One of those locals is Kenneth Wani. Kenneth, a victim of the war, became a refugee living in a camp in northern Uganda. In 2008, go ahead, I'm ready for the next picture. 2008, Kenneth was on the side of the road, literally, really. He was walking, he'd just come back from Uganda, and he was going to his home area. He's still searching for family members that may have survived the war. You know, he doesn't know who he will find in his home village. He has no job. His parents have both died, and so he is the oldest of his siblings, and he is responsible for taking care of his family. <clears throat> Two of my colleagues, who were there in 2008, saw him on the side of the road and really just picked him up. You know, like you see somebody walking on the side of the road, and it's hot. I mean, we do not lack for vitamin D in South Sudan. <laughs> and uh, they offer him a ride. He tells them his story, and they look at each other, and Robert and Colin is who is giving him a ride, and they said, you know, well, Kenneth, we'll hire you. You can be one of our laborers. You know, come help us build this school for girls in your neighborhood. So he got hired. He got a job that day. This is great good news. And, ladies and gentlemen, this is your Another little bonus fun fact. We go to the river, the Ye River. We dig sand, we mix it with water, we put it in the sun. You can have 300 bricks made by the end of one day. So if you ever want to build a school, you can do it too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Kenneth is one of those men. He's digging river sand, he's making bricks, he's making a building for us. Go ahead. In 2009, we discover that Kenneth 
while he was in the refugee camp in Uganda, had taken a few courses sponsored by the United Nations. Electrical engineering classes. <gasps> he could take a light bulb and a generator and a wire and give us light <laughs> in a place that does not routinely have electricity. That's a very special skill to have. So we promoted him. He became our electrical engineer. <laughs> So he worked uh, continuously at that campus. Then in 2010, go ahead. Oh, he thought one of our other employees, that nice woman in the red dress, her name is Nyoka. He thought she was kind of cute, and she thought he was kind of cute. <laughs> so they got married and made a really cute baby. <laughs> uh, both having been educated, Nyoka and Kenneth. And he has a newfound interest in girls' education because <laughs> they have a baby girl. Uh, our operations manager went on to do another project uh, with another organization. And so Kenneth was promoted again to our operations manager. He's gone from the side of the road to being the man in charge of logistics and operations of this quarter of a million dollar international non-government organization in Ye, South Sudan. You want to talk about an entrepreneurial spirit, somebody determined, somebody who can get things done, coming from the side of the road to being operations manager of this entire organization, but it gets better. Last year, Kenneth called us. Anita, I want to build my own school. OK. <laughs> How can we help facilitate that, Kenneth? <laughs> OK. And he said, I'd like a loan. We were able to give him about 5,000 US dollars. He hires his own laborers. Go ahead. And in 2011, he opens his own school that he has built and today has about 600 kids enrolled in that school. I know, right? Wow. That is the spirit of the people in South Sudan. Okay, you hear the bad things coming out of Africa, right? I mean, you hear about the disease, the poverty, the war. It's there, okay? It, it can't be denied. We know it. But that's not all of the story. I know more people like Kenneth than I do people who are fighting. I know more people who want this country to succeed and are willing to take the steps to make it succeed, to do whatever it takes, whether it's digging sand to make bricks or whether it's launching and starting your own school. So you better believe um, Kenneth in 2012, matter of fact, I just told him a couple days ago, he's getting promoted again. <laughs> Effective in 2012, he's going to be director of our schools. So everywhere we have students that we sponsor, he will be the man in charge of making sure that we are um, up to date with our MOUs, our memorandums of understanding, that qualified teachers are on each campus. Kenneth is equipped and has the gumption to make that happen. So. Uh, this is Kenneth's family, where he lives now, with the exception of Dr. Mia and me and this other white boy, his <laughs> not living there full time. But um, Kenneth and Yoka have had a second baby girl. So now he's really interested in girls' education. And this is a picture of his very first soccer team. Go ahead. Kenneth has named his school the Excel Academy. And you can see pictures here. It is not in the style of the building 
in which we are in, but it does have walls and students can bring their chairs with them, their little plastic chairs, so they have something to sit in. And this is what it looks like on Monday morning. We have assembly at 7.30 on Mondays where we have announcements about uh, what's happening at school, what's happening in classes, in the community. And the students gather and they come and they stand for about 30 minutes for assembly. Kenneth has hired local laborers to make some new desks so people might not have to bring their plastic chairs. You can fit two people at one of these desks and you can see inside the classroom here it has an iron sheet uh, as a roof and he is already expanding putting up a new building. Go ahead. It's kind of hard to see with the light but we don't have just bunk beds. We've got triple decker beds because that way you can have more people sleeping in a room and that means more people can come to school, right? So that's what we have. And uh, here's another shot of students coming for assembly. And this is the kitchen. We cook very traditionally over um, wood <laughs> and a pot. <laughs> and the cooks, you know, prepare, they chop the greens or prepare the rice or the beans and cook outside. Go ahead. Ooh, some nice donors gave some money for some science equipment. So the students are able to have a laboratory experience in their chemistry and bio classes. So yay for some nice donors who made that happen. And then here, look at Kenneth in his suit and his tie. I love it. Now, Sudan was colonized by Britain, right? So there's very much a British influence. In America, we call the leaders at school our student council or student government association, right? Something along those lines. Okay, well with the British influence there, we call the student leaders prefects, like in Harry Potter, right? Okay, prefects. So this is Kenneth's inaugural class of prefects, the very first leaders, student council, if you will, of his school. And they had a very formal, very nice prefectorial inauguration when they accepted the oath of office. It was a great day, really very fun and festive. Go ahead. Hey. Too. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is a perk of the job, ladies and gentlemen. I feel a little hot right now. <laughs> okay, I want to give a shout out <laughs> to George Clooney. Why? Because I can. Um, in all sincerity, you know, there are a lot of celebrities who have causes. And some are doing really good work in the world. And some do it for publicity. But George Clooney is the real deal. He puts his money where his mouth is. This man has traveled multiple times to Sudan. And Harvard, as in our American Ivy League institution, Harvard, is managing a bunch of satellites that the State Department has put in the sky over the border of North and South Sudan to make sure that there's no more fighting or if there's troop movement or anything that should not be happening, those satellites pick it up and our State Department can investigate. 
Well, somebody has to pay for those satellites to be put in the sky and for this to happen through Harvard. George Clooney pays for this to happen. He is committed to peace in South Sudan. Well, in the country, I mean, in the world, but specifically, when you hear him talking about South Sudan and you see him going to the White House or you see him holding rallies, he knows what he's talking about. And he's willing to go places that other people have not gone. And uh, so it really has been an honor and a privilege to be able to meet and talk with him about the new country of South Sudan and specifically the role that girls and women can play in the future. Go ahead. Oh, wait, 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 wait. This is Kenneth, Wani, again, okay, our same Kenneth. <laughs> All right, we walk away from our meeting. <clears throat> Kenneth is with me as we talk to them. And when we get out of earshot, and I'm still, you know, like sweat dripping and all excited and my heart fluttering, Kenneth looks at me and says, now who were those people again? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> oh, our greatest needs. Go ahead. All right, we're gearing up for 2012. Our school year runs March to December. And the students break in December and January and begin to come back uh, mid to late February. December and January are our hottest months. It's the driest season in South Sudan. Um, so as we prepare, we have already, I've talked with Kenneth and we've already identified what it is that we will need for the students. Well, food. Okay, we can grow a lot of food, but we still need some staple items. We don't grow our own rice. We don't grow our own cooking oil. <laughs> you know, things like that that you have to have in order to cook. So for one term, we've got three terms in a school year. It costs us $9,375 to feed approximately 250 people. We also need to hire some new teachers for next year. The teacher's salary for a full year is $2,250. I know, some of you have stars in your eyes and you want to come teach in South Sudan, yes? <laughs> All right, we have beds, or we need more beds. We need more of those triple-decker beds. So you can give three people a place to put their head at night uh, for $47 each. We, would like to have 30 new desks for next year, and those are $39 each. And textbooks are helpful. So we would like to have 260 new textbooks, and they run $12.50 each. So essentially, yeah, we want to fill up our, our shelves with textbooks. We want more kids to be able to sleep at night. Food, desks, those snazzy desks. And uh, this is one of the teachers. So those are the things that we're putting together. For 500 USD, that keeps one student in school for the entire year. OK, that's, those are the school materials, food, everything. So I, asked, I was at a high school in Virginia Beach last week. I love my job. <laughs> it takes me to the beach. It takes me to fun places like Johnson City. <laughs> And uh, I, asked, I asked one of the students there because I'm really, I am not techno savvy. I still have like a, you know, a phone that you could pick up an answer at home that's attached with a cord. So I'm not really that savvy. Um, but I know that there are people who are and they are really wanting new iPhones for Christmas. And so I asked how much that was. And the kids said it was like between four and 600 USD, depending on what you got. And that's maybe without a contract. All right, so if I just want to put this in perspective of one American gadget puts one student in school for an entire year. Just saying. I even have friends in Knoxville, I am quite positive, who spend more than 500 USD on a UT tailgating weekend. <laughs> right? Yeah. So just think about that, of how far a dollar goes in a new country. 
that is emerging and developing. These are our costs. Go ahead. So these are our beautiful, fabulous students. I'm going to say thank you for listening to me talk and then ask you for questions. But before I do, OK, I don't have those gadgets. But I do have a computer and a laptop, and I love Facebook. So become our friend on Facebook. Go to Africa ELI, OK, and hit like and follow us. Check out the pictures and places we go and hear the stories of the students. Um, and Twitter, I'm not very good at tweeting, but I have heard that you, if you post something here, you can get it to come out here. and. Blah, blah, blah. And maybe that's how you want to volunteer for the organization. <laughs> um, I have had lots of interns over the years, uh, about well, several, who have come to South Sudan, and then others who have been a help here in America. I mean, again, there are only two of us, right, in America, who try to keep this organization paid for and going. And I freely tell people that because I think it's a good story. And I think that you can see when donors give money where it goes. I mean, <laughs> we're not big enough for bureaucracy and overhead. So the money goes to the kids. And I love it when kids help kids or young adults help young adults, so forth and so on. Um, so anyway, think about ways that maybe you would want to help us out with fundraising, come up with a project, or maybe you have gifts like tweeting, and you could do that for me too. But uh, ask me, talk to me, tell me. Please tell me you've learned something in the last you know, 45 minutes. Yes? OK, ask. Um, this is really cool. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about um, the teachers in the school. Yes. If a US. Um, citizen wanted to teach in a school, do they have to have an education degree? Preferably. We would like to have qualified teachers. Mm -hmm. However, you can come and with the skills that you have, especially being here in a university in America, you could share those skills and that knowledge with our students. For example, we had two pre-med students come and they taught a health class for three months. Okay. And that was great fun. Um, they learned from each other, not only about health, but you know our different routines here in America and what it's like in South Sudan. So yes, you can come. The teachers that we hire, those that make the $2,250, <laughs> most of them are degreed from Uganda and from Kenya. Because South Sudan's education was interrupted, we don't have a lot of qualified teachers in country. So we go to the neighborhood and invite them to come and teach. Think about this. 25-ish, 30 years ago, they had the reign of Idi Amin in Uganda. OK, he destroyed everything, right? But Uganda has had time to recover and educate the population. So now that Su South Sudan is a baby and emerging, Uganda is coming to help us. In my brain, in another 25 to 30 years, wherever there is conflict in Africa, if they are emerging and coming out of it, who are they going to call? They're going to call South Sudan. They're going to call our students. How cool is that? You can come be a part of that. You know, okay. Bring your skills. Bring your knowledge. Share. Yes? Mm -hmm. from South Africa, so do you raise money, so does like their government donate, or our government, or anyone, or do you just do donations from, like how do you raise money? Okay. Is there a dumb question? How's that, it's, there are no dumb questions. <laughs> but <laughs> CRE, Christian Religious Education, is required to be taught as a subject in the South Sudan curriculum. Okay, okay so that's. So so that's one. Now, for fundraising, in America, we set up ourselves as a 501c3 charity. So we are recognized by the American federal government as a charitable organization. And this is how we raise money, like even today. 
I, I don't know who, this, one of you in this room will do something that will surprise me and bring great joy. I don't know who it is yet. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's somebody else. One of you is going to grow up, get big, and become a United Nations ambassador and improve relationships between South Sudan and the rest of the world. Or you're going to grow up and be a doctor, and you're, please come, you know, help us get rid of cholera, typhoid, and uh, uh, malaria. One of you is going to grow up, get big. Oh, please grow up, get big. Somebody become an engineer who can come fix our roads. Okay? It's not sexy, but if we fixed the roads in South Sudan, right? Oh my gosh, that would solve a lot of problems. Because then we could get supplies and resources into the villages and the rural areas where they need to go. All right, that, that would be really nice. And then one of you in this room, or maybe more, I don't know, you're going to decide as this group, you know, that you want to raise money, that you're going to sponsor a kid. You're going to get a girl next year in South Sudan. You're all going to contribute $500 and make that happen for her. Or you're going to go to your church and you're going to say, hey, I know this really fabulous woman named Anita who can come and talk to us. <laughs> Invite me. Oh, uh, here's your homework. Okay, you, you, have, you have two pieces of homework. Did you know you were going to get homework? One, in the next 24 to 48 hours, when you leave this place today, it is your job to tell at least three other people about the good news coming out of South Sudan, Africa. Okay? This is how it happens. This is the only way the good news spreads because... If we turn on the TV, we get the war, the poverty, the disease. But if you are telling people, hey, I saw girls in South Sudan getting educated. Hey, I know that George Clooney is doing good work and he's <laughs> helping keep peace in Sudan. Or, hey, you know, whatever information you're taking from today, tell three other people about it, okay? Expand the network, the circle of caring, all right? And then your other... Ooh, you've already had your other assignment, but let me just remind you, like us on Facebook, okay? Because then your friends will know. That's like telling more than three people. Get them to like us too. All right, so, um, yes, other question. Um, could you remember what ELI stands for? That's not my question, but... Yes, <laughs> Education and Leadership Initiative. Okay, um, I was wondering about if y'all have any issues about... Uh, female education, that there's a lot of controversy because they are use, losing their primary labor force. I mean, how do you get the girls to come to school? Is there a lot of controversy from the patriarchal families who don't want them going? And what about like other states who disagree? Like what you said, the radio talk show goes out for a lot of mm, mm -hmm. a lot of controversy. Mm. Do you have a lot of issues with people who aren't too happy about it, or how do you keep those girls in school and keep people coming? That is an excellent question. We have a lot of cultural learning that we have done very successfully, okay? And some, some days we've been really smart, and other days we have been successfully stupid and had some successful failures. But what happens when you have a successful failure? You learn. Okay, so for example, yeah, hey, I thought that everybody in the world wanted their girls to go to school. <clears throat> There's an area uh, that's actually up closer to the border. And there are many families and fathers who think that if their girls go to school, they will be spoiled. Because then they will know how to read, they'll know how to communicate, and they'll know the politics of man. And so they intentionally don't send their girls to school. They, all they want are just women who know how to cook and make babies and take care of the home, which is a very noble thing to do. But we want the girls to recognize they have choices. We're talking about freedom here. If you want to be a wife and a mother and taking care of the home, we celebrate your choice to do so, but we don't want you forced to do it. So what I've learned in those villages is that when I go to promote and recruit the students, I usually go with the county education officer 
So it's not just me. I'm working with somebody who's from that area. And the, the village elders, the tribal chiefs, the people from the community, they will be so nice to me. They will invite me in and we'll have tea. And I will talk to them about the importance of girls' education. And they will nod their heads, yes, yes, madam, that is wonderful, yes. And uh, they will send me on my way. I will leave, tra-la, and nothing gets done, right? I mean, they're just being nice to this foreign American visitor who's coming to encourage education, whatever, all right? So we've learned to solve that, we recruit the local fathers who do value education and have either put their daughter in one of our schools where we sponsor or they want to. I mean, they have a daughter who's in elementary school and she's coming up to go to high school. So they've already said, we hope you'll sponsor our daughter you know, when she finishes elementary school. They will listen to one of their own, to an equal, to a man, more closely than they will listen to someone like me. So do we run into issues related to girls' education? Absolutely. I mean, it's why one of the reasons they haven't had it. Um, but hopefully, we are open, and I very much believe that we can adapt to our circumstances uh, and are willing to learn how to help people better understand uh, what education will do for them, how they will all be served. In some instances, in locations like that, if you make it about economics, if you tell them that when your daughter is educated and she might get a job and she can earn more income for the family, their ears perk up. Uh, but you have to learn that and know that and work with it and understand. Do you know what the rate is in the states that have the schools available for girls that are actually going to school as those who are stepping home? The percentages mm -hmm. of girls in, oh, oh, like. Um, the states that do have the school girls programs, do you know how many girls within each of the, that are in the area and have the source available, how many are going to school as opposed to those who have their families keeping them at home? Mm -hmm. Okay. I have numbers that could probably indicate that. I don't keep statistics in my brain very well, but I did bring with me. Ooh, I just happen to have. Uh, this would be another good homework piece, too. I was going to share this with you later, but I'll share it with everybody here. Um, building a better pu future. Education for an independent South Sudan. This is a UNESCO report from an agency of the United Nations, and they have all these snazzy, wonderful charts and uh, statistics about when girls have enrolled and how they've enrolled and where they are. In 2010, according to this report, about 400 girls graduated from high school. That's a huge increase for South Sudan, and we're adding 54 to that number this year, so I anticipate it to continue going up. There's also another report. This is put out by the United States Institute of Peace from Washington, D.C., and this is Dowry and Division, Youth and State Building in South Sudan, because having a bride price still is very common. You exchange your daughter for money or for items that the family needs, and that's a cultural tradition that I'm still trying to come to terms with. That's very hard for me. I see it as a sale, but they see it as appreciation for raising a good daughter. You know, I will learn, they will learn, we will all learn together. But that's an interesting article on dowry and division. And I'm like running out of time. Any other, last question, yes? I was wondering when you, after you're like sitting on the library floor and being like, <laughs> you know, following up and being like, well, I'm gonna go there. Um, do you, I've kind of had that urge before, but I'm kind of I'm like, do I just drop myself in the middle of the continent? Yes. Like, you didn't know anybody? Or I didn't know anybody. But did you have contacts? You go. Because it's pretty dangerous if you don't know where it, you're. It is, but you know what? Don't let fear rule your life, okay? 
and um, it keeps you from doing some really meaningful things. Yes, you do have to be prudent. You do have to do some planning. And um, I was connected with an organization out of New York who had spent some time actually in Yay before. And so they helped make my arrangements. Okay. So called and got like one contact of an organization or something? Exactly. I mean, I could even help you with such, depending okay. if it's in East Africa. Okay. But uh, yes, so do not fear. All right, last story. Oh my gosh, I'm going to do it before they come in. One of the lost boys, his name is Abraham. He's from Vermont now, but he was seven when he had to cross the Nile River, okay, from Sudan into Ethiopia for safety because he was being chased by people with guns, all right? And I'm talking the Nile River, like, you know, baby Moses, Egypt, Nile River, right? <laughs> he saw a bunch of his little friends jumping in, and they were drowning, and they didn't make it. So Abraham and his little friends decided that they would hold hands when they jumped into the river because they thought it would make them stronger and more likely to survive the experience. Abraham and his little friends did survive. And they've grown up and they're telling this story. And he always says that we are stronger when we hold hands and are unified than when we are divided and work as individuals trying to do things on our own. So no matter where you go and what you do in the future, remember that we are all are connected and we are stronger when we hold hands and work together. You are fabulous and wonderful. Shukran tanate, asante sana, merci beaucoup, webelen yo! Go be free. <laughs> Hender Light. I mean, Hender Light. H E N D E R Light. L I G H T. Thank you. We want to thank Dr. Harley for helping us set this up. We want to thank Steve for providing the class board. Ms. Carey from Local Postal Affairs for helping us promote. Ms. Leia from the store for being here. And thank you all. Have a good semester and good luck with finals. I have some bookmarks with some of our contact information if you want. Yeah.